So with that, then we're gonna move on to the nervous system. And to be honest, this nervous system kind of section of content, you're really just gonna have to like memorize. It just kind of is what it is. You have to remember um, the differences between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, how to break down the autonomic and somatic, uh, the sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Um, part of that is just like repetition, 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 going over it and remembering what it is. We're going to talk about the basics. What are these different aspects of our nervous system? Um, and what is their role? Um, but I can only do so much to help you remember the differences. So that might just be something that you're going to have to revisit and uh, work through again. So like I said, there are, um, it's kind of like a tree in terms of our nervous system, right? The nervous system is everything, how our body feels, how our body regulates, how we breathe, how our heart beats versus how we um, play soccer or cook a meal, right? Like all of this plays into our nervous system. Um, and it, it's broken down into two kind of big umbrella systems. And one is the peripheral nervous system. And as you can see in this image, right, that's the, those are the nerves and the neurons that go out into our bodies. That's the stuff that's attached to our skin that makes it possible for us to feel things, right? It goes down into our toes and all throughout our bodies, right? Whereas the central nervous system, which you see here on the right highlighted in green, is really only your brain and your spinal cord, right? So kind of the big organs of the nervous system. So you have the central nervous system, that's your brain and your spinal cord. And then on the left here, you see the peripheral nervous system in pink, and that's the stuff that goes all out into your body. So with that, we know that the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. It is in charge of making decisions for the body, right? Um, Again, you can see here the orange highlighted part of this image. Um, we oftentimes refer to the central nervous system as the CNS, um, whereas on the flip side, the peripheral nervous system is obviously referred to as the PNS. So the peripheral nervous system here highlighted in yellow consists of the rest of the nervous system. It gathers and sends information to and from the rest of the body, right? Think about those types of neurons. You have Sensory and motor neurons, right? Sensory neurons are neurons that send signals from the body and motor neurons are uh, uh, neurons that signal to the body. Um, and then on the flip side, you have those interneurons which are specifically housed in the brain and in your spinal cord. And they're kind of the link between those sensory and motor neurons. If again, you're thinking back to that um, psych sim that you did yesterday. The next breakdown is looking specifically at the peripheral nervous system, right? The central nervous system really is just the brain, the brain stem and those interneurons that exist within there, um, kind of the nitty gritty stuff and um, the more specific stuff that you're gonna be looking at is within, is housed within the peripheral nervous system. Um, and this again is broken into two more umbrella categories. You have the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system, right? Somatic controls voluntary movements of skeletal muscles, right? So that's like, if I wanted to go for a run, I actively have to think about pumping my arms, bending my knees, um, like moving my hips or like whatever, however you, whatever you have to do to go for a run, right? So somatic is those voluntary muscle movements. Autonomic, right? Think automatic, autonomic controls self-regulated actions of internal organs and glands, right? How does our heart beat? Our heart is a muscle and it's continually contracting. And I'm not sitting here right now talking to you guys being like, pump, pump, pump. Like my body just does that. And that's because of the autonomic nervous system. Um, faction of the peripheral nervous system, right? Um, so autonomic controls self-regulated action of internal organs and glands, right? Those reflexes, things that we don't think about, right? Somatic is the things that we are thinking about and actively taking part in. 
With that in mind, it's important to recognize that the nerves consist of neural cables containing many accents. Um, so these nerves, right, we talk about, oh, you have a pinched nerve or whatever. Um, what are nerves? Well, they're part of the peripheral nervous system that connects muscles, glands, and sense organs to the central nervous system. So it's the way for your body's kind of perception of taste, sense, uh, or taste, Taste is a sense. Taste, smell, sight, touch, all of these like um, different what are senses, right? Nerves act as the cable, which contain many axons, which then produce axon potentials, which kind of send off signals across the body, right? Nerves are the connecting factor between um, the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. So just kind of keep that in mind. This cargo net image um, is a way to kind of think of like the netting, the connection um, between the two. The last kind of breakdown then is within the autonomic nervous system, right? That automated, our body does it without us thinking about it system, um, is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic um, is always focused on arousing, whereas the parasympathetic is always focused on calming. So when we think about sympathetic nervous system, the arousal system, um, that's going to be fight or flight. Think uh, the releasing of norepinephrine in times of stress or in a threatening situation. Your heart starts to beat faster. Your pupils will dilate. Your digestion will um, restrict, right? You're not going to be as hungry because you're so focused on everything else. You might get an adrenaline kick. Right? We hear these stories of people like lifting cars off of young children when they can't even lift a 20-pound dumbbell because of the adrenaline pumping through them. Right, This is all the sympathetic aspect of the autonomic nervous system. Once that kind of fight-or-flight response happens, then your parasympathetic nervous system is going to kick in. Right, Your pupils are going to contract. Your heart rate's going to decrease. You're not going to be sweaty. You're going to be hungry, right? Um, and so this is the rest and digest is what they call it. Um, so again, just these different factions of the nervous system are something that you're just going to have to kind of go through and remember um, and kind of work with a little bit. So just kind of recognize the, uh, the um, what is it, the formative uh, that's optional today. It's going to ask you to recall the different types of neurotransmitters and, and what we know about those neurotransmitters. And it's also, there's a part of it that asks you um, to distinguish the differences between these uh, factions of the nervous system. Um, so if you are interested, if you're like, do I really know this? Do I remember it? Like, do that optional formative. It's not graded. It's just a way for you to kind of self-check um, how well you're remembering and retaining some of this. So again, we all have a nervous system that's broken into two parts, the peripheral and the central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is like our body's movements, right? Um, so you have autonomic and somatic. Somatic, what we do on purpose. Autonomic, what our body does for us without thinking. And then within that autonomic, you have sympathetic, fight or flight, and parasympathetic, rest and digest, right? This seems to be a little bit out of place, but whatever. We didn't talk like in depth about the central nervous system and we're not really going to, but this just gives you a couple of definitions, right? The brain is a web of neural networks. We know that the brain houses millions and billions of, of um, connected neurons and um, synapses and dendrites and axon terminals, right? All of that is housed in the brain um, and the spinal cord. It's full of the interneurons, which I mentioned before, um, that sometimes have a mind of their own, right? They kind of make some of the decisions for our body um, without us really thinking about them. Um, they're the connection between the sensory and the motor neurons, right? That's that idea like a reflex would be an example of this. Um, somebody who like touches a hot stove like automatically pulls their hand away without even thinking about, ouch, that's hot. It takes a second to register as hot, but our body responds to it very quickly. That's that interneuron, that in connection between the sensory and the motor neurons. So with that, um, we know 
that the complex webs of interconnected neurons um, form with experience. The more often that we're like engaging in certain activities, think about like muscle memory, just like memory in general, the more often like we engage in those connections, um, the stronger they're going to be and this, the more neurons and the more um, connections that we're going to make. So neurons that fire together, wire together, right? That makes sense. It's pretty intuitive. Um, I mentioned this, but just so you guys have some definitions here, uh, sensory neurons carry messages in from the body's tissues, right? Motor neurons carry instructions out from the central nervous system to the body, and then interneurons process information between our sensory and motor our outputs. Like I said, this is the example. Um, your spine's interneurons trigger your hand to pull away from the fire before you can say, ouch, before your brain can like say like, ow, that hurt your body is quick to respond and pull your hand away. So that's an example of a reflex action, and that's when we're saying that, that those um, interneurons within, housed within um, your spinal cord have what, a quote, a mind of their own. That's what we're talking about here. So the last piece of the puzzle then, and I'm not really gonna give you, you honestly just need to know like the big, overarching picture of like what is the endocrine system. Um, it refers to a set of glands that produce chemical messengers called hormones. Um, and these are the different types of glands. For now, you will not need to have these different glands memorized. Um, we will kind of throughout the rest of the course um, with different content and different topics, like give specific examples and, and reference these. Um, you are gonna have to know some of the glands that exist within the brain because they're part of the anatomy of the brain. Um, but for now, I want you to just take a big picture understanding of it. Um, and because of that, I really just want you to watch um, the endocrine system crash course that's out there. Um, it's just gonna give you a brief overview um, it's about 11 minutes long, so I'll have you guys watch that, and that'll be the end of this lecture. Hormones! Those things that make teenagers moody and miserable, and they cause growth spurts and acne, and they make perfectly normal student totally obsessed with his algebra teacher. Not that I have any, you know, real boots on the ground experience with that last one. But all that mayhem is just the handiwork of your sex hormones. The fact is that there are more than 50 different kinds of hormones coursing through you right now, and all multicellular organisms produce produce one kind or another. For instance, hormones regulate the process of metamorphosis in insects. They're what stimulate plants to grow and fruits to ripen. In animals, the network that makes and releases hormones, your endocrine system, is one of the two ways, along with the nervous system, that important information is communicated from one part of your body to another. Right now, your endocrine system is spraying hormones into your bloodstream that are doing all kinds of things all over your body, giving instructions to other glands, regulating the levels of salt and sugar and water in your blood, telling your heart to beat faster, and Yes, they're partly responsible for that daydream you may or may not be having about Taylor Lautner right now. But keep your eye on the prize here. We're doing science. Pay attention. The endocrine system and the nervous system both carry information around the body, but while the nervous system carries information really quickly and the responses are usually short-lived, endocrine responses take a while to get going, but their effects can last for hours or even weeks. The word hormone comes from the Greek for to arouse activity, and they're secreted by endocrine glands, the series of organs that also manufacture them. In addition to endocrine glands, you also have exocrine glands like salivary glands and sweat glands, and as you can tell by the name, they send stuff outside of the body, whereas endocrine keep the crins, which is Greek for secretions, in. And your glands are all over the frickin' place. Some of the heaviest hitters are in your brain, but you also have them in your throat, right over your kidneys, right below your stomach, and of course, in your baby-making areas. All glands have blood vessels coming from them so that the hormones that they release can get into the bloodstream fast. And many of your hormones circulate through your whole body, only binding to the cells that have the right receptor proteins that fit them. But there are some hormone-driven messaging systems that are more localized. For instance, paracrine signaling releases hormone molecules that degrade really quickly and are only received within a small region of the body. Example? 
testosterone manufactured by the testes tells the testes how many sperm they need to be making right this second. And to see hormones work on an even smaller scale, get a load of autocrine signaling which sends chemical signals within a cell or from one cell to the adjacent cell at most. This is what happens in your immune system when a single T cell realizes it needs to start cloning itself so it can fight off a virus. Your cells receive hormones through signal receptors, but how and where a hormone binds to its receptor depends on what kind of hormone it is. There are three different types. There's the steroids, which do a lot more than make your muscles big and get you all angry and stuff. Steroids are derived from cholesterol, and there's a bunch of different types of them. There are peptides, which are just chains of amino acids, and monoamines, which are based on a single amino acid. The only really important thing we need to keep straight about these is that peptide and amine hormones are water-soluble and don't dissolve in lipids, and since cell membranes are made of lipids, those hormones can't pass into a cell. Instead, they bind with receptors that are on the surface of the cell. But steroids are lipid soluble, so they are able to penetrate the membrane and bind with receptors in the cell's nucleus. Using these methods, the endocrine system sends out all kinds of important chemical bulletins, many of which start up in the brain in a tiny, tiny gland about the size of a pea. The pituitary gland. The pituitary gland. It's the master gland. The Napoleon of the endocrine system. Except that Napoleon actually wasn't very small. That's a myth. But you get what I'm saying. The pituitary gland makes hormones that instruct other glands to make other hormones, and those hormones actually get the real legwork done. The pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus, the part of the brain that acts as a liaison between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So a big part of its job is to tell your glands what to do based on information it gets from your senses and other nerve functions. For example, breastfeeding women will start releasing milk when their baby starts crying. Sensory information, in this case auditory, comes to the hypothalamus from the nervous system, telling it that there, there's a little snuggle of baby nearby that might be hungry. This causes the hypothalamus to nudge the pituitary gland, which in turn releases hormones that stimulate milk production and secretion. Pretty cool. The pituitary gland sits directly underneath the hypothalamus and has two lobes, which are actually two different glands fused together. The posterior pituitary is an extension of the hypothalamus, and it secretes two hormones that are actually made by the hypothalamus. One of them is oxytocin, which stimulates contraction of the uterus during childbirth and helps with breastfeeding, but it probably also has a role in things like social recognition, pair bonding, orgasms, and anxiety, which is interesting and weird. And the other hormone secreted by the posterior pituitary is antidiuretic hormone, which tells the kidneys to retain water. The anterior pituitary, on the other hand, both manufactures and secretes a whole battery of hormones, and one of the places these hormones end up is the thyroid. The thyroid regulates your metabolism, your appetite, muscle function, blood pressure, heart rate, among other things. And the way that it interacts with the pituitary is a good example of a negative feedback loop, a method of communication that's common all over the body and especially in the endocrine system. Basically, the pituitary is like the thyroid's thermostat. It can read how much thyroid hormone is in your bloodstream, and when its levels are low, it spits out a tiny bit of thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH, which travels to the thyroid. The thyroid, in turn, secretes thyroid hormone, which boosts our metabolism, and that increase in metabolism tells the pituitary to stop sending out TSH. So the effect of the pituitary secretion is a signal to secrete less of it, and that's a negative feedback. Other glands that are controlled by His Royal Highness the pituitary gland include adrenal glands. These guys sit right on top of the kidneys and are in charge of making hormones that help the kidneys maintain the level of salt and water in your body, but they also, you may have heard, respond to stress. Want to see how it works? Well, let's say you're walking down the street minding your own business, and you get hit in the face by an angry duck. Let's say that this is unusual for you and you don't know what's going on, just that you're being attacked by something. As soon as the sympathetic nervous system senses that something potentially dangerous is happening, the hypothalamus tells the pituitary gland to secrete adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH, for those of us who don't have all frickin' day. This stimulates the adrenal glands to make epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. Now the epinephrine in your bloodstream will tell a bunch of different organs to do a bunch of different things all at once. Cut off blood supply to your digestive system, send a bunch of blood to your lungs and muscles, and speed up your heart rate, all to help you on your quest to vanquish this dastardly drake. Unlike pretty much every other muscle contraction in your body, your heart is controlled by the endocrine system as well as your nervous system. You may have noticed that after a scare, your heart races for a couple minutes afterwards. That's because the epinephrine is still in your bloodstream, telling your heart to race like crazy, even after you're no longer in mortal danger or whatever. Alright, I know you're wondering when we're gonna get to the gonads, but let me warm you up first with the function of your pancreas, super sexy gland, the biggest in the body. I've mentioned a couple times that glands regulate the balance of solutes in your blood. This is one of the most important things that the endocrine system does, and no one does it better 
than your pancreas. Because its job is to regulate the levels of glucose in your blood. And since glucose is what makes cellular respiration, and therefore your life possible, this is important. When the concentration of blood glucose rises, say after you eat a couple of ho-hos, the pancreas secretes insulin into the blood. The insulin then travels around your body and stimulates pretty much every type of body cell to absorb glucose. Liver and muscle cells convert the glucose to glycogen for storage, and other cells in the connective tissue called adipose cells convert the glucose into fat. But if your blood sugar is too low, your pancreas has got your back there too. Say you're in a push-up contest with Christian Bale, you're going to lose, but you're gonna try. And the trying? is going to require quite a lot of energy. Your friendly pancreas will release another hormone, glucagon, which stimulates the liver and muscles to start the process that breaks up the glycogen and fat to release the glucose so that you can, you know, lose to Christian Bale. But, you know, losing to Christian Bale is better than winning against most people. All right, so now that we're back to, you know, muscular men, let's, uh, let's get back to everybody's favorite topic. The gonads. Sex glands come in two different... Fla flavor? That's not the right word. Flavors? That's bad. Now, okay, well, whatever. We're just gonna go with it. There's the testes and there's the ovaries. They get instructions from the pituitary gland to make sex hormones. The testes make androgens, the main one of these being testosterone, which helps with sperm making, among other things. Ovaries make estrogens and progestins, which stimulate the growth of the uterine lining, and uh, some other stuff. Like what other stuff? Well, you might think that your biological sex is determined like by the parts that you have. But that's only kind of true. It turns out that why we're either male or female has a lot to do with hormones. And someone get me a chair so I can tell you how we know that. Back in the 1940s, French embryologist Alfred Jost was studying sex differentiation in bunnies because that's what you do when you are a French embryologist in the 1940s, apparently. He wondered whether the hormones secreted by the gonads during embryonic development had anything to do with whether a bunny embryo turned out to be a boy or a girl. So, he uh, very carefully, very, very carefully, and this is a little disturbing, removed bunny embryos from their mother. And then, also very carefully, removed the part that would become the ovaries or the testes from the bunny embryos. And then, also very carefully, he put the embryos back in the mama rabbit. What Joss found, after the bunnies were born, was that the ones that he performed the surgery on turned out to be girls. So, in the absence of gonads and therefore hormones that specifically instructed the development of testes and the growth of a pee pee and a deep bunny voice, he discovered that the default setting for mammalian embryos is make it female. So, sex hormones are hard at work even during fetal development to make us who we are, but they're super hard at work during puberty when the pituitary gland puts the gonads on red alert in boys, telling the testes to make a whole lot of androgens like testosterone that lower the voice and make a bunch of hair, increase muscle and bone mass, and encourage people to do stupid stunts and post them on YouTube. In girls, estrogens, the most important ones being estradiol and progestins like progesterone, kick off the process of menstruation and breast growth and all that good stuff, largely helping the female body get ready to grow and nurse a baby. But what we still don't understand very well is how sex hormones affect our emotions. We do know, for example, that estrogen is required for the manufacture of serotonin, the neurotransmitter that gives us a sense of calm and well-being. So when estrogen levels drop quickly during a woman's menstrual cycle, it can make her feel off kilter. But the effects of sex hormones not just on our bodies, but our minds, remains a significant mystery. Which is good, because I don't want to even go there. Thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Biology. Table of contents over there. If you want to revisit anything, thanks to everyone who helped put this episode together. And if you have any questions for us, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, and of course, there's the comments below.